Hi, good morning everyone. Thanks for joining us again today. Today we have Chuck Kayser. He is an organic farmer extraordinaire and a composting expert and we have so many things to talk about. So thank you so much for joining us today, Chuck. Thanks, Joy, for having me. I'm really happy to be here. That's awesome. Would you mind just starting by introducing yourself a little bit? Sure. Um, I've been in Japan about 22 years. Uh, before that, I lived in the States. I was born and raised near Chicago and uh, always been a teacher. I've been a teacher for 25 years uh, and uh, started farming about 13, 14 years ago, you know, just dabbling. And uh, it's just kind of really grown on me. And uh it's become more and more a part of my life and a part of my purpose in life. And, uh, yeah, I just hope that it's something I can do for the rest of uh, my days. That's great. Uh, let's start a little bit with Midori Farms. Can you give us some background, how you started? Sure. Um, Midori Farm, actually, the name Midori Farms came about about three years ago. Uh, before that, there was a brief stint with OK Fields. And then before that, it was just me going up into the mountains. And really, the farming was something to do to allow me to be up in the mountains. Um, it's such a beautiful, natural area with the mountains and the river and all the, you know, the wildlife and the plants. And it just became something that was really uh, fulfilling for me just to be there in nature. And so the farming was just kind of a way to be there. And actually, when I first started, uh, I didn't want to farm at all. I, I wanted to buy a little tiny piece of land and build a log cabin. Um, and the old guy who was selling it, he said, yeah, OK, we agreed on a price. And we went to the office and they said, sorry, this land hasn't been zoned in over 100 years. We need to rezone it and it'll cost this much. And I said, oh, I can't I can't do that. And um, he said, Chuck, why don't you just use it as a garden? That's what my wife was using it for before she passed. And I said, I, I, I don't have any interest in doing that. But the local people said, Chuck, if you want to buy land in the mountains, it's really hard because people don't know who you are. So if you if you garden for a year or two, the people, local people will get to know you. Maybe they'll trust you and offer you a different piece of land for sale. That's why I started farming. I'm totally by accident, just okay, I'll throw some seeds in the ground and look like I know what I'm doing, just to get some other offers on a piece of land. And after a year or two, I forgot about buying land and I just wanted to grow more vegetables. So yeah, just totally by That's accident. Great. Yeah, it's just, it's very organic and fluid the way that, that your experience has, has landed you right in organic farming. Um, of course, I need to shout out to Stuart Galbraith. He's the reason I found you um, because of his documentary about the gaijin of Minka Alley out there. That's right. And this week as well, we have Mike Barr, who's also in right. that documentary, and another one yeah. of your neighbors, right? That's right. He's a good guy. Yeah. Um, now, I'm showing right now your website, your Instagram page, your Facebook page. Now, on your mm -hmm. Facebook page, recently you've been doing some events. Do you want to introduce that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, it was. I was very fortunate uh, in my circles have grown and grown over the years being an organic farmer. I, You just tend to meet people who are, you know, kind of in the same circles as you, as in anything. And uh, I've been lucky enough to meet some Japanese people who are quite involved in sustainability and environmentalism, naturalism and things like that. And uh, one of them helped me to get a grant a few years ago. And that grant led to me doing a neighborhood composting program, uh, which is great. And then this past year, uh, another grant came up through the Heiwato Corporation. Big shout out to them and a big thank you uh, for accepting my application to start a community farm. Um, being, being a grower uh, for so long, I've met a lot of people with a lot of different ideas. And I've been very interested in the Japanese ideas about farming because uh, something I may touch on later is that there's a great need for more farmers in Japan and for people to be more connected to their food. And when I would come back into town with a box of dirty vegetables to give away or sell, Japanese people would often have a different attitude towards them than, uh, than the Western people. Um, not in a negative way, just a different idea. And um, a lot of them expected me to just be giving them away. And I, and I asked around, I'm like, why don't you expect to pay for something like that or give fair value for it or something like that? And they said, well, when we were children, 
a lot of us had the opportunity to visit our, our uncle or our grandfather's farm. And yeah, just pick it, pick, please take it with you. I have way too much, you know, I, we will never sell it all. We can't sell the ugly ones anyway. And um, a lot of farms were set up just for fun, just for hobbies. So it was, it was okay if with retired people. And I, I learned over the years that um, a lot of the farmers are somewhat hard hobbyists, or at least they're not so invested in the sales of the vegetables. They're more landowners making their money that way, and they're, they're part of old families who have money. So the farming is something that they do more out of a sense of responsibility for the lineage of the family. Like, oh, the Yamamotos have always been farmers, and you're the 20th generation, so of course the oldest son is going to be a farmer. And also a lot of children had experiences out on rice um, sorry rice fields doing tau away the rice planting as well as on sweet potato fields where harvesting and a lot of sweet potato farms used to be set up for the community to come and learn about agriculture a little bit the kids come out and harvest the sweet potatoes and they roast them up and eat them and with the increase in population and the change in the economics in the past 30 years i think a lot of community gardens have gone the way of parking lots and strip malls, and um, people are losing that opportunity. So when this Heiwato grant came up and they said, well, we want you to do something that's preserving something, like preserving a wildlife area or an, an animal or something like that. And I said, well, how about this idea of preserving community farms? And they said, okay. And so I now am, I set up a farm that was fallow for three to five years. I don't even know how long. And we had a big event. And we pulled all the weeds out and tilled it up and mixed the soil with some good stuff and planted out our sweet potatoes. And now we have a, a working sweet potato farm that's for the community. And I have events once a month for people to come out, take a look at the farm, see how they're growing. And eventually we'll, of course, harvest and eat them. But that won't be until the fall. And then, for example, it was, uh, what was it, two Sundays ago, we had our event number three, and we spent most of the time on my other farm so that everybody who came out could see how tomatoes and cucumbers and eggplants and, you know, cabbages and carrots and beets and other things like that grow and they could harvest some carrots and then talk about it. And then we could also play in the mountains. We could swim in the river and go hiking and things like that. Because personally, I feel, um, like I said before, Japan is somewhat has been losing touch with their, with their history of being really connected with nature and local seasonal food and an organic lifestyle. And so giving people an opportunity to do that, especially families with kids, I feel is a great uh, asset and a great um, way to help this movement of sustainability and general health of uh, the population. So, How did that um, composting program, the composting initiative, how did that go? Was it a success or tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I, I don't know if anybody out there has done grant applications. They're, they're monumental. They're, they're hard. <laughs> they're really hard. So we had to make a very detailed plan. Um, with costs and everything else uh, for both the community farm and the composting program. And um, so we had to detail how we're going to do the composting program. And I've been composting for over 10 years. You just call me a professional, but please don't think me a professional. I'm still dabbling and um, I'm still improving my systems, but I do really like it. And I have a, a great use for it on the farm. So I'm doing everything I can. Um, but basically, we decided to give everybody a small container uh, at their house, and outside our house, we would put a couple of big containers. And the idea being when your container is full or, or any time you want, you come over to our house, dump it into our container, and away you go. And that's been working pretty well. I get about one giant bucket every two weeks uh, from local people. Um, you know, I have about 10 or 12 families and friends who come in my area. So there's no driving to my house to drop off the compost. And then it goes into my car and comes with me to the farm. So there's no extra gas expenditure or anything like that. And then I compost that with uh, organic rice hulls that I've been able to get through an organic rice farmer in Shiga as well. So, so far, so good. And I think it's given the Japanese local people the idea that, wow, um, you've really reduced my burnable trash. And this, uh, this stuff is really useful. And actually at the end of the program, the program formally finished at the end of last year, uh, or I'm sorry, this past spring, yeah. And uh, we gave everybody a potted plant 
lettuce plants, three lettuce plants with half compost, half good potting soil. And then they were able to have that as a present for giving me all their compost for a year. And so I think now still people are coming and I still get about a bucket every two weeks. So I feel like people see the usefulness of it and the, the sense of it. And I'm, I'm happy about that. Yeah, I was really inspired by composting when I visited Kamikatsu, the zero waste oh, town of sure, Japan, sure. right, in Tokushima. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they have mandatory composting. All residents right. of Kamikatsu must compost at home or they subsidize a machine they can do it if they're in an apartment or a local allotment they can put their compost and so i came home and i immediately tried it it cut our waste in half yep. um i had a machine for a while now i dig it into our small garden um it definitely cuts down your waste seriously and i i we have a local uh farmer thomas klepper of pitchfork farms oh and i love tom he's great and we, we often talk about trying to do some kind of composting scheme like you did. Um, but just the logistics of it, like how to, I, I have a monthly cleanup activity cleaning up the rivers of plastic waste. And I asked people to bring their compost and nobody did, right? Because it's like, it's kind of, it's gross, it's smelly, like people, people are worried about giving, but yeah. you know, Thomas yeah. is really into the idea. So hopefully we can try something like you did here as well in I think Hiroshima. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we've got some compo uh, <laughs> some comments. <laughs> <laughs> Allison says, great idea for community composting and we know you will use it. Yeah. Thank you, uh -huh. Allison. Allison is in Fukuoka. Okay. Well, there are a lot of prefectures and a lot of cities that actually have composting programs. Um, for example, Otsu in Shiga, just next door to Kyoto, has one where you can actually give away, give them your compost. And then they'll drop off a bag of finished compost at the collection center and you can oh, take as much as you want. Nice. Wow. Revolutionary. Yeah. Why aren't we all doing this? But, yes. Yeah. Clementine Sandner of uh, Mikan Bags also said, Czech's veggies are the best. I was very lucky to have a weekly basket back in Kyoto. So delicious. Wow. So I think she's moved down to Kyushu now, but she used to live in Kyoto. Yeah, yeah hi awesome. there. Good to, good to hear from you. <laughs> now, on your, let's talk about your website a little bit. On your website, sure. um, That's, uh, midorifarm.net. Midorifarm.net. You've got a uh, take a monthly idea. Right. Can you introduce that? Sure. Um, this is uh, this is something probably a lot of people don't know about farmers. There's probably a lot a lot of people don't know about farmers, and I only say that because I've learned what I didn't know about farmers along the way. I'm, by the way, I'm not a trained professional. I never went to school and studied farming. I never trained on a farm. It was all learn as I go, make loads of mistakes, podcasts, YouTube, internet searches. What ask the local people. So I'm no pro myself, but what I've learned about farmers is there are different kinds of farmers, not just like, well, that's a carrot farmer and that's a potato farmer. No, that's not what I'm talking about. It's how you sell your vegetables. So there's market farmers who take their vegetables to giant markets and sell them wholesale or take them to farmers markets. And then there's um, farmers who, who specialize in one or two different things and sell to restaurants and, and, and some special supermarkets. And then there's what I do, which is uh, called a CSA, Community Supported Agriculture, or in Japan, a Teike farmer. And these are farmers who um, grow a wide variety of things and customers subscribe and pay for baskets in advance and then receive a basket a week or, or every two weeks and get a wide variety of whatever's fresh now. And so the farmer is uh, able to feel very light because their vegetables are pre-sold and they're able to just fill the baskets and drop them off on their way home or put them at a central collection point and people can come and pick them up. And uh, now let me back up a little. Some of the farmers are kind of both. They do farmers markets and CSA. But for me, it's the CSA model. I'm a very small farmer. So I grow about 60 to 80 different varieties of vegetables every year so that everybody has a big variety. And plus my family gets all the ugly stuff so we get healthy as well. So that's what I do. Yeah, wonderful. I'm showing pictures of your beautiful vegetables um, right now. Of course, if you do the take-a system, that would be seasonal vegetables. Of course. Just whatever you have ready. 
at that time of year, which is the best, most sustainable way to eat, by the way, in case you're wondering. <laughs> yep. I'm sure way, people know that. Yeah. The vegetables come in a basket. There is absolutely no packaging whatsoever. Once in a while, we'll wrap our zucchinis in a little bit of newspaper to keep them from getting damaged because the skins are quite uh, tender. But we basically harvest them that day, wash them off in some clean mountain water, put them into a basket, and deliver them to you as fresh as can be without any packaging or extra transportation costs. That's, that's one of my main goals. Is As a farmer, I've done a lot of research, and I've learned that, well, an organic farmer has a triple bottom line, not just the profit, but what are you doing to the community and what are you doing to the environment? And so I really try to you know, eliminate my impact on the environment as much as possible. So I don't have a giant walk-in refrigerator. Instead, we have these baskets that we submerge into the river in the summertime so that they're washed and kept cool until it's time to take them back to the city and sell them. So we really try to hit that, you know, zero impact mark as much as possible. Yeah, I'm showing the baskets in the river, re yeah. natural refrigerator right now. What a great idea. I wasn't it's, sure it's, if you had amazing. beers in there or what, but I, now I know, <laughs> <laughs> which is also a good idea. Sometimes we do. <laughs> <laughs> also, on your website, uh, it says sometimes you're at the Yokai Soho Market. Well, I'm sorry. I am, as we, I might have mentioned earlier, I'm not the most technological savvy guy and so my website's a bit out of date yokai soho is a fantastic idea place but it's actually no longer exists oh, i mean the building bad. does but the actual entity where i would sell vegetables doesn't anymore so i haven't done that in a few years but you Sorry, do go to you could do go to markets sometimes i do not no. i found that veg, uh, or uh, farmers markets do exist in kyoto um but they don't suit me um and yeah, I just find that its CSA model suits me a lot better. Right. Yeah. I think um, Nagano Naturally, Heather Fukase, mm -hmm. she, oh, she's great. She also she does a kind of a take a system, uh, whatever she has that she's mm -hmm. and her family's not eating. <laughs> you might be able to get about. She's she's a great farmer as well. She was also in the yeah. series. Um, yeah. That's awesome. awesome. Let's let's talk about you sent me a bunch of pictures of the locals who support you in your area. Do you want to yeah. talk about your local community network a bit? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Um, like I said, I, I really didn't have any training as a farmer. Uh, basically, what I did about 14 years ago, I wanted to build a log cabin up in the mountains and to have a place for myself and my family to go up there and stay. and. You know, that's that's kind of a, what I wanted to do. So I found a little piece of land. My, my friends who lived there found me a little piece of land. It took them a few years uh, because the land is not easily sold up there. They, they've, it's been in the families for generations, like 20 generations, so they don't want to sell. And But finally, there's a little piece of land. Okay, he'll sell this. And we negotiated a price. We went to the, the office, and they said, sorry, you got to pay this extra money for zoning. Can't do it. So I became the accidental farmer because they said, you should farm it instead, you know, and then other people see you, they'll offer you a new piece of land. Well, this was all happening because of the oldest gentleman in the, in the village, um, Sasai-san. He's now about 95 and he's still going. And he, he's a wonderful man who just let me use his farm for free for about 13 years now. And then I got good enough or I was there enough to where another local guy said, hey, Chuck, you know, I got a piece of land I'm not really using if you want to farm it. And I was surprised. I said, why, why these people are so generous and kind, but why would they want to do this? And then I realized how much work it is to keep a farm. And if I'd been keeping my farm up for 30 to 50 years and then suddenly I stop, in a year it's gone. It's totally gone. I mean, it's back to wild. So to see all your hard work and effort uh, just go back to nature, it must be kind of depressing. So they were very happy to see me taking advantage of uh, the, um, the the resources that they had used for so very long. So he let me use his, and then that's uh, uh, Tsubamoto-san. And I later actually rented a house from him, and I'm, that's what we're using as our volunteer house. And then a few years later, another guy asked me, so now I have four fields that uh, I pay very little rent on. And uh, I'm able to grow as much as I can and as best as I can. And everything's watered with natural mountain water. And I don't put any chemicals in. And I use as little plastics as possible. So, yeah. That's wonderful. 
All right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about volunteers. You have a good network set up of events and volunteers. You want to introduce that to us? How does that work? Yeah. Um, so basically, like I said, let's put the number 13 out there for how many years I've been farming. I'm not really exactly sure. but So for 10 years, I was doing it all by myself. There was maybe a, five times total people came up and helped me in 10 years. And so I was just used to it. It was just my, my way of being up there. And it was very lonely, um, but it was just what I did. And then about three years ago, when I started my website, Emmy Dory Farm, formally, um, a woman came along to buy my vegetables, a Canadian woman. And she said, oh, these are great. And she said, I want to come and help on the farm. I said, great. Yeah. So she came up. And after twice coming up, she said, Chuck, you need a volunteer program. And I said, what's that? And she introduced me to work away. And a lot of people may have heard of woofing. It's kind of the oldest or most famous volunteer program for people to volunteer on organic farms or otherwise nowadays. And Workaway is very similar, but it's a bit modernized and simpler to use, she said. And she had been a Workaway. So she set me up a profile on Workaway, and you can still see it at Midori Farms. And people who want to travel and don't have a lot of money and also want to be part of an ECHO project can find me and apply and I as a host can accept them and then we agree to dates and then they come up and stay from a week to three or four months and I provide them you know room and board so they stay in the volunteer house and I uh, make sure they have enough food to eat and then every week they work 25 or 30 hours for me and the days that I'm not there, it's awesome because they can do the watering, the weeding, chasing away the monkeys or whatever I give them to do. And as the longer they stay, the more they learn, the more they get into farming. And I have so many who come just hoping to be in nature and be in Japan. And when they leave, they're like, I'm starting my own garden when I get home. And that's very inspiring. And um, I, uh, I just love my volunteers. Unfortunately, Corona has limited the number of people who can come in and out of Japan. And it's really kind of hamstring my whole volunteer operation this year. I had booked people through October, two people at a time. I was all set. And then travel restrictions and everything else. And now I have nobody. So I'm begging and pleading anybody who has a free day, Monday, Wednesday, or Friday, come on up to the farm with me and have some fun and we'll do some work and I'll teach you some stuff and you'll have a good time. Yeah. Yeah, you you're having some monkey issues. I <laughs> I often hear when I watch your videos or I saw this on Facebook you're asking for volunteers to come help with the the fences because of the monkeys, right? Tell me tell me about the monkeys. Yeah. <laughs> I better take a drink of water before. I <laughs> <laughs> There's always issues with local wild animals who are very happy that you're farming beautiful veggies, but not always good for you, right? Definitely not. I mean, it's complimentary to be on their list. They're like, hey, let's go over to Chuck's farm. You know? <laughs> He's got fresh kabocha and daikon now. You know? Well, um, yeah, this is another thing that nobody really expects from such a cute, cuddly, human-looking animal as a monkey. And, um, but they are absolutely devastating. I mean, I listen to podcasts and people complain about rabbits and raccoons and deer and squirrels. And I think like, oh, you poor babies. You know, my invaders have thumbs. You know, they have and language. And they're smart, they, right? They are really, really smart. And they work as a team. They have scouts out to watch. Oh. And then they signal, hey, he's coming, he's coming, get off the farm, or it's okay, it's okay, you go, 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 and oh, it's terrible, because they can oh. dig under, they can climb over, they can jump, they can throw the babies over, they throw the vegetables back, you know, they bite oh through the nets God. and everything else, so last year I was fortunate enough to have a great group of people out from Worcester Polytechnic Institute and help me design a, a composting program that was solar powered. And I said, can we put an electric fence on that? And they're like, sure, no problem. And it's actually that that has been so life-changing for me is because now I have on farm number two uh, uh, an electric fence that actually keeps them out. And it's insane. I had so many cabbages this year. I don't know what to do with them. I'm making sauerkraut for the first time because I, I, I can't sell them all. Usually the monkeys take more than half. 
And, you know, for the past uh, eight years, they've taken about 50 to 70 percent of my vegetables. Um, they'll devastate entire crops. Well, they, you know, they don't touch things like okra and peppers and, and some things like that that they don't really recognize as food. But things like daikon and cabbage, broccoli, sweet potatoes, they'll take the lot. You know, they'll take everything. Wow. So it's been it's been really life changing to have these electric fences, and I'm a, I'm right now in in the in the, uh, the process of installing one on farm number three. Um, but first, I have to put the top net over for the ravens. I'd say ravens are uh. they're just equally smart as the monkey. <laughs> I'm gonna put I'm gonna post a video on my YouTube channel. It's Midori Farm on YouTube. Uh, 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 about this raven, I have this game of John Speary out, and she he talk, get a game cam. You'll catch, you'll be able to capture what's getting on your field and stuff like that. So I do, and I have these great shots of this raven showing up the first day and just kind of shopping around and bopping around. The second day, testing them. The next day, he takes a different one, and then and at the end, he snaps off this one that's right in the foreground. Uh, it's going to make a great video. And I mean, I hate these, these bloody birds, but it'll make a funny video. And I might do it. Wow. Voice yeah. Well, well, it could help your but YouTube channel I, grow. Um, but yeah, yeah they're, the they're people, smart. I, I've heard that about crows as well. Around the garbage, there's, well, everybody's battling you know, the crows you know with the garbage that, covers. I, this is right? something I learned just a few days ago. Did you know that crows is actually a group of birds? Is that right? There's no one bird that's a crow. I believe it. So the common raven uh, is a crow. Uh, so I, I had no idea because I'm looking up karasu in the translation of like crow and I'm like, that doesn't look like a crow. It looks like a raven. And I look it up and that's what I found out. So yeah, it is a crow actually. And what Japanese call karasu, we call a common raven, but it is also a crow. So there you go. There's your science tip for the day. Yeah. Uh, we but, have a, yeah, another, another comment from Allison. She says, great info about work away. Bet you could find some locals who would love to help. I would if I was in Kyoto or maybe when we can travel again, I'd love to learn from you. Thank you, Allison. Yeah, please come on out. Contact me through my website. Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Uh, let's talk but about, I, I, yeah, let's talk about seasons on the farm because yeah. it's, it's very season connected to what you can grow, but also what you can do. I heard in one of your Pecha Kucha talks that um, you have developed systems which allow you to farm a month longer than most of the locals. So That's right. Yeah. Tell us about right. your systems and seasons, if you can. Okay. Yeah. Um, the system you were speaking of is probably building raised beds. And raised beds are basically um, mounding up the soil so that it's higher than what would normally be ground level. And that's a raised bed, it's pretty simple. Um, now I've gone to the second step of actually creating giant containers that are 15 to 20 meters long and about a meter and a half wide and made out of wood and this kind of holds the soil like a giant box. And um, what, what those allow me to do is it's, it allows me to keep the soil from kind of eroding away. And it also kind of blocks out weeds. There's a lot of benefits to having the, the container around there. And what it also does is it helps with drainage because most of the soil is above ground level, the water will drain off. Now, if you get a meter or more of snow on your farm, you're not only waiting for that snow to melt, but you're waiting for that soil to dry out after that meter or more of snow worth of water is on your field. Well, because my beds are in a higher position than the walkways, the water drains to the walkways, the beds dry faster, unable to plant much earlier. So that was something that I've learned. I learned about five years ago, and uh, it's really changed how I grow things. Yeah, interesting. Um, I've seen this on a bunch of different farms, organic um, as well as regular farms. The plastic. Let's talk about the plastic covering. It seems like a necessary evil, right? Because you have to cover um, because the weeds are so horrible. But it's it's just, it's plastic. It's only single use, right? Is there no alternative to this? Mm. Well, um, what you're talking about is plastic mulch. Mulch just means anything you put on top of the soil to keep in moisture and or to prevent weed growth. So it could be plastic mulch, you could use leaves, you could use straw, you could use uh, rice husks or several different uh, organic things versus plastic. And when I first started 
gardening and farming, I didn't use anything. And my plants were swallowed up by grasses and weeds. And um, that's when I learned, like, oh, most people use this, this plastic. So I started using it. And it was great because I was going to the farm at that point, maybe once a week, maybe, maybe even once every two weeks. So the weeds and the grass were just more, you know, just killing my plants or taking all the nutrients out of the soil. So I learned to use it and I used it for about five years. And then when I started having volunteers, I started using it less and less. And now it's kind of like training uh, your beds, your, your, your garden beds to not have weeds. It's, you just learn to prevent weeds. Like around the area of your farm where weeds grow, you cut them before they go to seed. As soon as you see weeds, you pull them out and you just keep on it. I mean, for any organic farmer who doesn't use plastic mulch, weeding is a part of every day. And it's not like something you spend, okay, we're going to spend two hours weeding every day. That's maybe once every two or three weeks or every month, you do a big weed out. But otherwise, it's just, well, I'm harvesting carrots, oh, there's a weed, you know, or I'm, I'm trellising the tomatoes, oh, there's a weed, or I'm walking around the bed, and I'll just pull that weed. And again, having volunteers is a game changer for that um, because they're able to do a lot of that as well but it just becomes part of the routine um, after a while and then the beds look so much nicer and it feels so much better at the end of the year not to have this giant bag like for me for my small farms even that I would have five huge garbage bags full of this plastic that's going off to be burned and that's just horrible now this year I did start that community farm on this fallow field. We covered it with black plastic mulch because there's no way we would be able to fight that the first year. And I've learned that um, the first year I use a new field, I use that stuff just because I don't have the manpower to, to, to tackle the weeds. But yeah. then after a year or two, those weeds die away and I won't need it. Wow. It'd be great if for farmers, because you need that, con it's convenience, but it's also you just cannot weed that much when you're first starting out, it'd be great if there was a biodegradable version, whereas after a year, it would biodegrade back into the soil, or mm -hmm. it could be put in with compost after it's used. I mean, there should be innovation for that. I, I hope it gets a bit better. But that's interesting that you say as you develop the farm, as you develop um, what's around it, you, you have less need for it. That's really interesting. That's right. That's right. Uh, sorry, I cut you off. You were talking about seasons. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Well, um, I'm going to dip now into a little bit of climate change because, uh, I mean, probably everybody who's watching this, when it's raining outside, it's like, oh, it's raining. But it means it's raining on my head, uh, you know, or when it's cold outside or when it's windy or there's a typhoon or when it's really hot and sunny. I'm still out there, you know, rain or shine, hot or cold, uh, farming. And uh, I have watched climate change. So anybody who's a denier, just come on out and I'll, I'll show you the proof. Because when I first started, there was over a meter of snow uh, in my valley. I'm about 365 meters above sea level in a very narrow mountain valley in Shiga. And so it's a microclimate. And it gets much more snow than Kyoto City, which is just an hour away. But, you know, a meter and a half of snow for up to four months of the year. And then that went down to three months, and then it went down to two months, and then it went down to about less than a meter. And last year, we had 30 centimeters of snow on the ground for less than a month. Um, now, this is just horribly shocking to everybody and very depressing. Of course, there's a bright side that my farm, my time of farming has been extended. I, I now could overwinter some vegetables that otherwise wouldn't. Overwintering means the snow falls and you just let them set there. And then when the snow melts, hopefully they'll come back or they'll, they'll still be alive. That never happened for three or four months in the dark under so much snow. Everything is dead. But now things are able to actually come back. So um, season extension has been something that not only I've done intentionally through raised beds and using uh, floating row cover and other sorts of techniques, but also just because of climate change. So, yeah. So you don't have the heavy snowfall problem that you used to, but of course you're going to have more rain, flooding problems, more dry summers perhaps. Correct. And the, the, the other side of that coin is that, well, because the snow melts faster, guess what? The insects wake up a lot sooner. And of course we love insects. They're a very important part of the ecosystem, but on the farm they're almost always a burden. Um, they're eating something of mine. So it just means that 
you know, they start earlier. So by midsummer, their populations are three or four times what they normally would be because so many more generations were able to reproduce and da da da. da. So everything's kind of moving a lot faster. And the other side of that is uh, probably some people have heard of the old farmer's almanac um, back in the States where. Farmers would live and die by these things because they had the first frost dates, the last frost dates, your planting schedules, your moon schedules. And while the moon hasn't really changed as far as I know, um, your first frost and your last frost dates are incredibly important for your planting schedule because you don't want your crops to be subject to frost. Otherwise, they might die. So now that's all out the window because nobody can predict accurately when the first and last frost is going to be. And that's really challenging for a lot of farmers. Even somebody on such a small scale as me feels the impact of that because now I'm not sure when to plant out my cabbages because the, the autumn is too warm for them. Is, am I going to get snowed over or is it going to be okay? So it's a big gamble right now. So there's a lot of uh, wild cards now for farmers all over the world because of climate change. Yeah, that's a big issue. Well, let's talk a little bit about the stats that you sent me about self-sufficiency and those other issues as why you feel it's so important to support local organic farms right now? Mm -hmm. Well, especially in Japan. Um, I have been doing this for a long time and I'm also a fairly social person and I, I like going out and going to events and things. And there's an event called Pechakucha Night. Uh, which is uh, created in Japan, but now exists in over a thousand cities all over the world. A little group that basically runs events every month, every year, or every couple of months or whatever. And they gather a bunch of people together to do small, short, like six and a half minute presentations with slides. And then people can discuss that and things like that. It's a great format for uh, having a drinking event and learning something. And, being able to interact with different people. And so I, I, was, I, I was accepted to do a Pecha Kucha talk about three or four years ago. And until then, I mean, I was just going to talk about farming techniques and things like that. But I decided to delve a little deeper and find out what was the situation for agriculture in Japan. And when I did that, I found some very, very shocking results that I talked about. And everybody there came up to me later and said, wow, I had no idea. And uh, I'm going to try to look at some now. Um, so for all the supposed, you know, uh, first world countries or uh, first world economies, Japan is the only one that's in such dire uh, straits as far as growing their own food. Uh, Japan uses their stuff. See, uh, their, their index is based on calories, not on food. Um, and that's basically because, well, yeah, Kobe beef, for example, a lot of people worldwide love and know Kobe beef. But yeah, sure, Kobe beef is raised in Japan. But what about what those cows eat? Because the amount of calories those cows consume in their lifetime is far greater than the calories they provide to humans in meat. So actually, Japan is below 40% self sufficiency for calories, which is disgusting. I mean, it's the only country like that that's not in incredibly impoverished. You know, think places like Somalia are like this, you know, where there's a lot of starving people. So it's really unusual for the situation to exist. And um, uh, back in 1979, I'm sorry, back in 1960, uh, we were at 79% self-sufficiency. And basically, it's the new Japanese diet, eating a lot more fats, a lot more meats, and eating a lot more flour uh, that has really created this dearth in uh, self-sufficiency. And um, basically, from 1960 to 2005, rice consumption in Japan per capita has decreased by 50%. So if Japan were just to go back to the traditional diet of rice, uh, vegetables, and some seafood, we would be about 100%. But because of all the foreign imported foods and all the different diets and everything else and all the meat, we're way, way below that. And um, also government policies have kind of uh, affected that as well. For example, um, they reduced the acreage where people can grow rice to control the price of rice. 
So there's been a lot of reasons why this has happened, both from the community or the, the human fact, the human sector, as well as from the government and the corporate sector. Um, but right now, we really need to try to return to a local uh, organic diet, uh, more traditional foods, eat seasonably, seasonally, seasonally, <laughs> and uh, things like that. So that's basically self-sufficiency. Um, the other two things that I've really been shocked by is uh, in the past uh, 10 years or so, uh, the amount of farms in Japan has decreased by 30%. And the amount of corporate farms has gone up over 200%. And the reason I say that is because corporate farms are the ones who are the most polluting and the ones who are not providing the high quality organic healthy, nutritive vegetables, but more the beautiful carrot. And all the carrots look exactly the same. Uh, and the beautiful tomato. And they're also the, the industry that's promoting dump the ugly ones or dump the excess. We don't want it on the market. We want to control the price here. So that's also shocking. And the third and uh, final shocking statistic that I've heard was the average age for farmers in Japan is over 65 years old. Um, like. Back in 2015, they did a study and 65% were 65 and older. And that's not good. That's not good at all because farming is a very labor intensive activity. So what's going to happen when these folks retire? Um, the young people don't want to go into the agricultural sector. They don't want to live in the countryside where the farms are. Our self-sufficiency is going to really go even lower. So it's time that people at least know this so that they can base decisions, base their decisions on how to buy produce, where to buy produce, and who to support with their spending dollar or spending in uh, so they can really help to change these things because we're, yeah, we're very fragile. And I mean, if trade routes were shut down suddenly or, or there was global, you know, disaster or world war or something like that, what are we going to eat? You know, what are we going to eat? So let's try eating this healthy, sustainable diet now to kind of level things out so that we are more resilient should some sort of crisis come along. Yeah. When I was talking to Kyle, um, who runs Kamimomi Permaculture Center in Okayama, he was talking huh? about um, how small, medium farmers, rice farmers especially, it's really difficult to make any kind of margin. Um, so uh, he's trying to set up direct sales to the customer because if they sell it to JA, for example, JA takes 50%. And so that's all the margins, that's all oh, really? <laughs> the margins are ridiculous. So even though, you know, it's like an aging population, I see people um, during golden week or during the holidays doing the rice harvesting because the family can come back and help. They just can't do it because of age right. and, and lack of, of profit margins. And there's mm -hmm. a bunch of things making it harder and harder. So this 40% yeah. is going to get worse and worse until we start making farming and growing your own organic veg more appealing. So I really appreciate all the support you've, you've been doing to not only your farm, but to encourage more farming interest from the wider community. So you're doing a great job. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Joy. And you're also helping to raise awareness of these issues by having these these shows. So I want to say thank you to you as well. Oh, That's what it's you. about is letting people know what the facts are so we can all make better decisions. Yeah. Yeah. And then hopefully people are surprised and go make changes. Um, you in your latest YouTube video, which was also a live stream, one of your Facebook um, events, uh, which is so fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you also mentioned some of these factors and uh, try to encourage people to grow their own food, even in the city. And you mentioned John Walsh, who, of course, was in the series as well. He's, That's right. He's helping people do urban farming on their own terraces. So there's a, a lot of people really trying to help out. Uh, let's talk about your live stream events a bit. That's fun. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's part of uh, the community farming uh, grant that I got. Um, the original grant application had us doing six or eight events of the year, having everybody come out to the farm. 
And since COVID hit and everybody's gone online and nobody should really be getting together for social distancing and this and that and traveling to a different prefecture is also not really a good idea to spread the, vi the virus. So what I decided is I'm going to do these live events on Zoom and that way people can be there or at least watch a video later and still get the information and participate. So it's been fun. It's been a learning curve, and I'm still on that curve, but uh, so far so good, I think. And I'm about to post my, my latest one. Like I said, not last Sunday, but two Sundays ago, we did our third event. And I'm just getting the video edited uh, and ready to put up there. So yeah, that should yeah, be coming Yeah, that was soon. really fun because um, you had some comments from people, I guess because you're using Zoom, so they could show you the plants that they're trying to grow and you could give right. advice on that. So very similar to the Seeking Sustainability number one, when we had John Walsh, we had Thomas, and we had avid gardeners and they were giving each other advice and ideas back and forth. It's so fun. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that's that. That's great. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really what I want to get into is being more, doing more of community outreach and things like that. Yeah, and the, so you can find that on the YouTube channel. If you're watching um, your Midori Farms YouTube channel, we'll have the links below. Um, but Perfect. also you can join these community farm events via Facebook, right? Um, yeah, I usually post them on Facebook and announce them, announce them and then it's a, a Zoom event, so people just need to have Zoom on their device and then they can join in. That's right. That's great. Um, you recently posted something about flooding in your area. Did you did you have some issues um, for flooding, or maybe that was last? Oh, last two years ago. Sorry. Oh, okay. So there. Well, when the typhoons come through, um, and for anybody not living in Japan, Japan gets about fifty typhoons a year. Some skip off, some hit one small area, and some stay and ravage, like Godzilla. And a few years ago, we did have a really big major one that just tore through our area. And because of climate change, again, the ocean warming, the typhoons are able to be born much closer to Japan, whereas they used to be born around the Philippines. They're now born about, around Okinawa, so I've heard. And so they're like teenagers, really rambunctious and full of energy when they hit Japan, whereas before they used to be, well, oh, they're in their 40s or 50s, so they're a bit slow and there's a lot of rain, but not so much damage, usually. But now it's, it's changed, so um, that was a really, really bad one that knocked down a lot of trees and created a lot of problems and landslides, so yeah. Yeah, I have volunteered on some landslide cleanup projects over the years in Hiroshima. We have a lot of landslides oh, as well. Sure, sure, yeah. sure, sure. Um, people often comment, when I post photos, they'll comment, yeah, Hiroshima's soil is no good. <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know if it's fast, oh. fast forest growing or where they situated the communities. But where I was volunteering the last time was an area that was never hit by floods in all of their history. You know, mm -hmm. so it's mm -hmm. just climate change. This is going to happen yeah. more and more. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, I see that you're making some jam. Oh, no, I'm not making jams. I'm making pickles, pesto, okay. and uh, sauerkraut. Okay, yeah, yeah it looks like this jam. This is a new thing this year. Nice. Yeah, it does. <laughs> but don't put that on toast. I don't think that would be very tasty. But, pesto, um, yeah, though, it, sounds amazing. It's it's It kind of came to me because um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and a lot of farmers to diversify have what's called added value products. And... Pickles I've been making for a couple of years just for my family. And I said, okay, I can up that. And pesto, I decided, well, what are we going to do with all these extra broccoli leaves? This was after the monkeys had hit our broccoli. And they usually eat the entire plant, actually. Um, but they'd left some of the leaves. And um, there were some other plants that were too young and wouldn't make it. And I said, I wonder if we can make a pesto from this. And I looked it up, and it turns out you can make pesto out of anything. So um, I started making pestos out of broccoli leaves, cauliflower leaves, kale and things like that. And they've been really, uh, really delicious and uh, somewhat popular with the customers. You know, what some people order an extra jar of pesto or something like that. That's awesome. And, uh, it just has the mixed greens, um, some rocket, some carrot leaves, some broccoli or whatever. And then it has tahini instead of uh, cheese. I use walnuts. So it's vegan and then salt and garlic and olive oil and that's it. Cool. So it's it's a real natural sort of thing and I keep it in the freezer so it doesn't have to have preservatives. 
and then when it's ready to go, you can, if you eat it within two or three weeks, it should be all right. So that sounds and then awesome. I'm doing pickles. And people can order like this it. from your website. Well, <sighs> or send you a message. Yeah, they would probably have to send me a message. Okay. I don't have a, a like a, a market option on my website right now, and I don't really ship stuff. Okay. Um, I, I'm trying to stay local yeah. as much as possible, but I can tell. I can tell if I continue on my growth. I'm going to have to start selling online because I'll just have too much produce and other things. So I'm moving towards that. And if people ask me, it may be able to be worked out. But if I'm going to ship something like a head of cabbage, it may be all right. But if I'm going to ship a head of lettuce, it's going to go bad yeah. unless I wrap it in plastic. So it's that it's that threshold I have to cross. Yeah. Uh, or the or cool, like the cool tucky bean, the yeah. sending it out cool, which is more expensive, but it arrives in better condition, right? Sure, sure, sure. So it's just, it's again, it's just going to be changing my business model to suit, you know, the times and everything else, yeah. which I'm not saying isn't going to happen, but hasn't happened yet. So. Okay. Um, I have this nice picture of you saying farm to table negi is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, that was fun. And I noticed you're wearing knee pads. So on your yeah, knees a lot it helps yeah i mean uh it's either that or bending over and i'm i'm turning 50 next year so my back isn't gonna really take it much more and and i do aikido so i'm very comfortable sitting in what's called seiza which is where you have your kind of legs folded under you and well there's lots of rocks and things on on the, on the walkways of the farm so i don't want to be kneeling on those so i'm also a bit of a carpenter so I have these knee pads for working on floors because I've I put the floor in my house and then the, the farmhouse and there's a lot of, you know, on my knees sort of work as a, as a carpenter too. So I just pulled those out one day and used them on the farm and I've never gone back. This is like six years ago. So every day I'm on the farm, I put on my farming duds. You know, I got my hat, I got my towel, I got my scissors in my holster and then I've got my knee pads on. That's just part of my, yeah. my uniform. It's your and that uniform. way at any time I can get down on my knees and, and, and feel comfortable for weeding or for looking for insects or harvesting or doing whatever. So, yeah. yeah. No, whatever works. Whatever keeps you going out there, right? That's right. <laughs> um, I also noticed you had some shrooms. Are you doing mushrooms? Um, I'm only doing shiitake mushrooms right now. They're pretty simple. Um, a lot of people do them hobbyist style, and uh, I've uh, been able to acquire some oak uh, branches from local uh, landowners. So, and then I just seed them with these uh, mycelium plugs, and then wait a year or two, and then the mushrooms come, and the monkeys eat most of them. So, but this year I moved them on into my electric fence, so I hope they won't get them again. Yeah, but, uh, mm -hmm. mushrooms are great. Mushrooms are fantastic. So good. And actually, I have got some friends who are super mycologists, and um, the things I've learned about mushrooms, it's my new favorite organism. I mean, it's its absolutely amazing. And it's so regenerative for this, the ecosystem. And it's so healthy for us that almost all mushrooms have medicinal pro properties. So, And these little white button mushrooms are probably the exception. So, yeah. Um, those well, that, those the, giant shiitake that I'm showing in the picture right now, those are yeah. like the Western portobello mushrooms, which are so right. good. If you marinate and you put on the barbecue and then put in sandwiches, oh, yeah. you don't That's need true. meat. That is nature's like meaty alternative, right? That's correct. <laughs> That's correct. You're right. Yeah, the shiitake. I mean, I have a lot of volunteers coming from all over the world. And as I say, I provide food. So I purchase lots of different kinds of mushrooms for them. And they say, Japan has the best mushrooms in the world. So I've never good. had mushrooms as good. Unless you're a mushroom collector, you can't get high quality mushrooms like that. So. Yeah, it, I think Japan is very fortunate to have things like shiitake and things like that. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, we've got five more minutes. Is there anything we haven't covered you'd like to touch on? Mm, well, um, because your, um, your uh, program is called Seeking Sustainability Live, I might mention that uh, about three years ago, I'm, I partnered up with somebody and we started a group called Seeds of Sustainability in Kyoto. And our goal was this. I mean, because I was doing Midori Farm already and I was having events there, I really felt there was a need to connect the city of Kyoto more to the environment and other things like that. And I was learning more about composting at that time. And there's a giant park in the middle of Kyoto City called Gosho, which is the Imperial Palace Park, where the old Imperial Palace is to this day. Actually, and it's surrounded by with trees of all varieties dropping their leaves. And in the fall, 
I'd watch them pack them up into these burnable garbage bags and tote them off to the incinerator to be burned. And I feel like, oh, my God. That's life-changing compost uh, material, you know, that, that would be so great to be able to distribute that to farms. And so our, my partner, my goal at that point was to try to do that. We haven't gotten there yet, but that was our goal, and we started making these events. And we actually took over Pecha Kucha Nights to have a sustainability-themed Pecha Kucha Night, where everybody's talking about something sustainable. We do events out in the mountains, then we did uh, farmer's markets. Then we moved up into meetups and uh, workshops and things like that last year. But with Corona around now, we found that the meetups were much more difficult and much less uh, a good idea. So we put that whole thing on hold. But still, there's Seeds of Sustainability exists, and we hope to start up real soon. Um, so I think that overall, since I started farming, the thing I learned most is um, – how wonderful it is to be connected with our environment and our food and be part of the solution. I mean, climate change is all around us. And if you choose to ignore it, that's what most people do. But when you feel like you're part of the solution, it's really, it's really wonderful. It's a really wonderful feeling. And I encourage everybody. I mean, you don't have to grow a lot of vegetables. You can grow some in pots and you don't even have to grow anything. You can just go to a local farmer's market or join a, a CSA or take a system or just start eating more healthily, more locally, maybe eating less meat, less imported foods, um, trying to collect uh, more compost and help someone doing composting or reduce your impact somehow because being part of the solution is, is a much happier way to live than uh, kind of being part of the problem. Yeah, for sure. I've got your one of your images up now, local, locavorism versus globavorism. Yeah. <laughs> Goes right, right into what you're talking about. Buy local, as local as possible. Grow at least a little bit of your own would be awesome. But buying local is, right. a, is a great help, right? That's right. That's that old term from back in the 90s or 80s, you know, think globally, act locally. I think that still applies. Yeah, awesome. So uh, let's send people to your Facebook page, your hmm. Instagram page, and your website. Any mm -hmm. Anywhere else people can get information? YouTube, yes. YouTube, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I saw that you were also featured in Kyoto Journal, and you said right, Japan right. Times as well? Mm -hmm. This was a few years ago, but yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And just recently enjoyed Kyoto, the July edition featured in that and um yeah and thank you so much for having me on this this show i really appreciate this uh, opportunity yes. to talk about this stuff yeah awesome and thank you so much for not only growing organic veg but also training and inspiring other people to not only grow organic veg but also think about these issues a lot more thank you so much mm. Mm. my pleasure thank you everybody for joining today and uh, definitely have a look at Chuck's YouTube channel and Facebook page and website. And hopefully uh, we can all join your next community garden live stream and ask you loads of difficult questions. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> I love your connection. You went out to the stream and showed the stream and everything, but it wasn't at all pixelated. You must have a great, like, cable or something I, out there a lot of people have commented on that and i don't do anything special i think i was just lucky but wow, uh, yeah it's, it's nice when the picture is clear i guess when you move the camera during zoom it doesn't work but when you set it down then it kind of can can be in a good situation but i'm still learning like i said technology and me <laughs> we get along okay sometimes but not always <laughs> but it's great that you have a good cellular network out there so that you can show mm -hmm live live footage real time of what it actually is like so thank you that's not true on all the farms oh, no? my best farm is not it doesn't have good reception so i can't do a good event like that so yeah that's yeah. unfortunate but you know you do what you can i mean the, if there's anything the organic farming has taught me it's just do the best you can and be that, satisfied with that that is a very <laughs> good rule and you can't fight with mother nature so you have to oh no <laughs> It's like basically trying to fight the ocean. You can spend your time trying to fight the waves or you can try surfing instead. And that's what I try to do is just surf. Surf. <laughs> I like that analogy. Uh, Allison's last comment. She says, so much fascinating and valuable info. Off to follow Midori Farm. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you, Allison. <laughs> Thank you very much.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Chuck, for all your insights. And thank everyone, you, thank you for watching. Uh, have a great day. Take care. Go buy some local veg. <laughs> <laughs>